Good morning, everybody. It's a beautiful Sunday in May, and we are back with Anne Frank, The Diary of a Young Girl, and we are starting on page 228. Um, we are nearing the end of the book. We do not have much more of a journey to go with Anne in the annex, but um, she is still continuing to tell us about everything going on in her daily life with her high hopes for a future. And so let's start with Monday, the 8th of May, 1944. Dear Kitty, have I ever really told you anything about our family? I don't think I have, so I will begin now. My father's parents were very rich. His father had worked himself right up, and his mother came from a prominent family who were also rich. So in his youth, Daddy had a real little rich boy's upbringing. Parties every week, balls, festivities, beautiful girls, dinners, a large home, etc., etc. After Grandpa's death, all the money was lost during the World War. And they're talking about World War I and the inflation that followed. Daddy was therefore extremely well brought up and he laughed very much yesterday when for the first time in his 55 years, he scraped out the frying pan at the table. Mummy's parents were rich too and we often listened open mouthed to stories of engagement parties of 250 people, private balls and dinners. One certainly could not call us rich now, but all my hopes are pinned on after the war. I can assure you I'm not at all keen on a narrow, cramped existence like Mummy and Margot. I'd adore to go to Paris for a year and London for a year to learn the languages and study the history of art. Compare that with Margot, who wants to be a midwife in Palestine. I always long to see beautiful dresses and interesting people. So guys, think about it. Had Anne lived to be even longer, you can just imagine probably what she would have accomplished because her dreams were just out of this world or at least out of her country. She wants to go to big places, do big things, and be known um, for her writing. So uh, it's kind of sad to think that we couldn't see more of what Anne could have accomplished had she lived past such a young age. I want to see something of the world and do all kinds of exciting things. I've already told you this before, and the little money as well won't do any harm. Meep told us this morning about a party she went to to celebrate an engagement. Both the future bride and bridegroom came from rich families, and everything was very grand. Meat made our mouths water telling us about the food they had. Vegetable soup with minced meatballs in it, cheese, rolls, or d'oeuvres with eggs and roast beef, fancy cakes, wine, and cigarettes, as much as you wanted of everything, black market. Meep had chin drinks. Can that be the woman who calls herself a teetotaler? If Meep had all those, I wonder however many her spouse managed to knock back. Naturally, everyone at the party was a bit tipsy. There were two policemen from the fighting squad who took photos of the engaged couple. It seems as if they are never far from Meep's thoughts because she too took down the addresses of these men at once in case anything should happen at some time or other. And good Dutchmen might come in useful. Remember, we've talked about the fact that you had the Dutchmen that you wanted on your side and then there were the Dutch police that basically were working um, and snitching to the Nazis. So you had to be really careful about who you confided in. She made our mouths water. We, who get nothing but two spoonfuls of porridge for our breakfast and whose tummies were so empty that they were positively rattling. We, who get nothing but half-cooked spinach to preserve the vitamins and rotten potatoes day after day. We, who get nothing but lettuce, cooked or raw, spinach and yet again spinach in our hollow stomachs. Perhaps we may yet grow to be as strong as Pie Pie, although I don't see much sign of it at present. If Meep had taken us to the party, we shouldn't have left any rolls for the other guests. I can tell you, we positively drew the words from Meep's lips. We gathered around her as if we'd never heard about delicious food or smart people in our lives before. And these are the granddaughters of a millionaire. The world is a queer place, yours Anne. So you just think about what her life had been as compared to what it is now. And someone might think of Meep as bragging, talking about the parties, but no, they want to hear these stories because they miss those things on the outside world. And so every time Meep tells them of something, they're just totally enthralled. We're at 2.30, Tuesday 9th of May, 1944. Dear Kitty, I finished my story of Ellen the Fairy. I've copied it out on a nice notebook paper. It certainly looks very attractive, but is it really enough for Daddy's birthday? 
I don't know. Margot and Mummy have both written poems for him. Mr. Crayler came upstairs this afternoon with the news that Mrs. B, who used to act as demonstrator for the business, wants to eat her box lunch in the office here at two o'clock every afternoon. Think of it. No one can come upstairs anymore. The potatoes cannot be delivered. Ellie can't have any lunch. We can't go to the WC, the water closet. We mustn't move, etc., etc. We thought of the wildest and most varied suggestions to wheedle her away. Van Dyne thought that a good laxative in her coffee would be sufficient. No, replied Kufus, I beg of you not. Then we'd never get her off the box. In other words, she'd be having to go to the bathroom all the time. Resounding laughter, off the box, asked Miss Van Dyne. What does that mean? An explanation followed. Can I, always, can I always use it? She then asked stupidly. Imagine it, Ellie giggled. If one asked for the box in Binkorf's, they wouldn't even understand what you mean. Oh, Kit, it's such wonderful weather. If only I could go outdoors, yours, Anne. So I might make a note of that, that Miss B is wanting to eat her lunch in the office every day at two. So as if they're not cramped enough in the annex, it's gonna cramp their lifestyle even more as to whether they're gonna be able to go in the annex. Wednesday, the 10th of May, 1944. Dear Kitty, we were sitting in the attic doing some French yesterday afternoon when I suddenly heard water pattering down behind me. I asked Peter what it could be, but he didn't even reply. He simply tore up to the loft where the source of the disaster was and pushed Mushi, who, because of the wet earth box, had sat beside it harshly back to the right place. A great din and disturbance followed, and Mushi, who had finished by that time, dashed downstairs. So the kitty has basically done her tinkling where she shouldn't be, and great mess is occurring. Mushi, seeking the convenience of something similar to his box, had chosen some wood shavings. The pool had trickled down from the loft into the attic immediately and unfortunately landed just beside and in the barrel of potatoes. Gross. The ceiling was dripping and as the attic floor is not free from holes either, several yellow drips came through the ceiling into the dining room between a pile of stockings and some books which were lying on the table. I was doubled up with laughter. It really was a scream. There was Mushi crouching under a chair, Peter with water, bleaching powder, and floor cloth and Van Dyne trying to soothe everyone. The calamity was soon over, but it's a well-known fact that cats' puddles positively stink. The potatoes proved this only too clearly, and also the wood shavings that Daddy collected in a bucket to be burned. Poor Mushi, how were you to know that peat is unobtainable? So normally what they would put in Mushi's box, you know, the peat they're, they're not able to get right now. So gross, that's all I can say. P.S. Our beloved Queen, talking about Queen Elizabeth, spoke to us yesterday and this evening. She is taking a holiday in order to be strong for her return to Holland. She used words like soon, when I am back, speedy liberation, heroism, and heavy burdens. A speech by Gerbrandi followed. A clergyman concluded with a prayer to God to take care of the Jews, the people in concentration camps, in prisons, and in Germany. 232. Thursday, the 11th of May, 1944. Dear Kitty, I'm frightfully busy at the moment, and although it sounds mad, I haven't time to get through my pile of work. Shall I tell you briefly what I've got to do? Well then, by tomorrow I must finish reading the first part of Galileo Galilei, as it has to be returned to the library. I only started it yesterday, but I shall manage if it Next week, I have got to read Palestine at the Crossroads in the second part of Galilee. Next, I finished reading the first part of the biography of the Emperor, the Emperor Charles V yesterday, and it's essential that I work out all the diagrams and family trees that I've collected from it. After that, I have three pages of foreign words gathered from various books, which have all got to be recited, written down, and learned. Number four is that my film stars are all mixed up together and are simply gasping to be tidied up. That's funny. She kind of um, uses personification there to give pictures of film stars real life qualities as if they are actually basically talking to her. And since Professor Anne, as she's already said, is choked with work, the chaos will have to remain a chaos. Next, Theseus, Oedipus, Peleus, Orpheus, 
Jason and Hercules are awaiting their turn to be arranged as their different deeds lie crisscross in my mind like fancy threads in a dress. That's a simile. It's also high time Myron and Phidias had some treatment if they wished to remain at all coherent. Likewise, it's the same with the seven and nine years war. I'm mixing everything up together at this rate. Yes, but what can one do with such a memory? Think how forgetful I shall be when I'm 80. Oh, something else, the Bible. How long is it still going to take before I meet the bathing Susanna? And what do they mean by the guilt of Sodom and Gomorrah? Oh, there is such, still such a terrible lot to find out and to learn. And in the meantime, I've left Lizolette of the faults completely in the lurch. Kitty, can you see that I'm just about bursting? Now about something else. You've known for a long time that my greatest wish is to become a journalist someday and later on a famous writer. Whether these leanings towards greatness or insanity will ever materialize remains to be seen, but I certainly have the subjects in my mind. You know, that's almost foreshadowing because we know if they will be seen. And it's kind of sad considering we know the outcome. And, but guys, I think about everything she reads. Now granted, she loves to read. She loves to soak all this in. But you know, I think as um, you young students read, sometimes when you feel like you're given a lot to read, it's just exhausting to you. But you look at what all this girl does. Now guys, she does regular schooling. She's like on permanent remote school. And she is reading books that some kids today would open and not even understand. So again, just think of the intelligence and the work ethic of a girl who in some ways seems so silly. In other ways, we see such great maturity in her. I'm just so impressed. And it really makes me feel weak compared to what all she did. Um, going back to the book, I have other ideas as well. Besides Het Artibuis, and I'm not sure I pronounced that right, but I will write more fully about them some other time when they have taken a clearer form in my mind. Yours, Anne. Saturday, the 13th of May, 1944. We are on page 233. Dearest Kitty, it was Daddy's birthday yesterday. Make note of that. Mummy and Daddy have been married 19 years. The charwoman wasn't below, and the sun shone as it has never shone before in 1944. Our horse chestnut is in full bloom thickly covered with leaves and much more beautiful than last year. Daddy received a biography of the life of Linnaeus from Cufus, a book on nature from Crater, Amsterdam by the Water from Dussel, a gigantic box from Van Dan, beautifully done up and almost professionally decorated, containing three eggs, a bottle of beer, a bottle of yogurt, and a green tie. It made our pot of syrup seem rather small. My roses smelled lovely compared with Meeps and Ellie's carnations, which had no smell, but were very pretty too. He was certainly spoiled. Fifty fancy pastries have arrived heavenly. Daddy himself treated us to spiced gingerbread, beer for the gentlemen, and yogurt for the ladies. Enjoyment all around. Yours, Anne. So it looks like he had a pretty nice party. Um, we are on 234. Tuesday, the 16th of May, 1944. Dearest Kitty, just for a change, as we haven't talked about them for so long, I want to tell you a little discussion that went on between Mr. and Mrs. Van Dyne yesterday. Mrs. Van Dyne. The Germans are sure to have made the Atlantic Wall very strong indeed. They will certainly do all in their power to hold back the English. It's amazing how strong the Germans are. Mr. Van Dyne. Oh, yes, incredibly. Mrs. Van Dyne. Yes. Mr. Van Dan, the Germans are so strong, they're sure to win the war in the end, in spite of everything. Mrs. Van Dan, it's quite possible. I'm not convinced of the opposite yet. In other words, she's not convinced that the Germans wouldn't win. Mr. Van Dan, I won't bother to reply anymore. Mrs. Van Dan, still, you always do answer me. You can't resist capping me every time. Mr. Van Dan, of course not, but my replies are the bare minimum. Mrs. Van Dan, but still you do reply and you always have to be in the right. Your prophecies don't always come true by a long shot. Mr. Van Dan, they have up till now. Mrs. Van Dan, that's not true. The invasion was to have come last year and the Finns were to have been out of the war by now. Italy was finished in the winter, but the Russians would always have Limburg. Oh no, I don't think much of your prophecies. Mr. Van Dan standing up. It's about time you shut your mouth. 
One day I'll show you that I'm right. Sooner or later, you'll get enough of it. I can't bear any more of your grousing. You're so infuriating, but you'll stew in your own juice one day. End of part one. I really couldn't help laughing, Mummy too, while Peter sat biting his lip. Oh, those stupid grown-ups. They'd do better to start learning themselves before they have so much to say to the younger generation. Yours, Anne. So she's kind of, again, poking fun at, she thinks, the immaturity of some of the adults in the annex. Friday, 19th of May, 1944. Dear Kitty, I felt rotten yesterday, really out of sorts, unusual for Anne, with tummy ache and every other imaginable misery. I'm much better again today. I feel very hungry, but I'd better not touch the kidney beans we're having today. All goes well with Peter and me. The poor boy seems to need a little love, even more than I do. He blushes every evening when he gets his good night kiss and simply begs for another. I wonder if I'm a good substitute for Bochy. I don't mind. He is happy now that he knows that someone loves him. After my laborious conquest, I've got the situation a bit more in hand now. But I don't think my love has cooled off. He's a darling, but I soon closed up my inner self from him. If he wants to force the lock again, he'll have to work a good deal harder than before. Remember, Anne was always talking about how she feels like that she's the one kind of that does the talking and does most of the work in their relationship. So she's basically saying, you know, he's going to have to work on this a little bit if it's going to go anywhere. 2.36, Saturday, 20th of May, 1944. Dear Kitty, last evening I came downstairs from the attic, and as I entered the room, saw at once the lovely vase of carnations lying on the floor. Mummy down on hands and knees, mopping up, and Margot fishing up some papers from the floor. What's happened here? I asked, full of misgivings, and not even waiting for their answers, tried to sum up the damage from a distance. My whole portfolio of family trees, writing books, textbooks, everything was soaked. I nearly wept and was so worked up that I can hardly remember what I said, but Margot said that I let fly something about incalculable loss, frightful, terrible, can never be repaired, and still more. Daddy burst out laughing, Mummy and Margot joined in, but I could have cried over all the toil that was wasted and the diagrams I'd so carefully worked out. And what do you guys think? I kind of don't blame her. Because that is one thing that she totally adores doing. It's what she's been spending her time doing. And she feels like at the moment it's destroyed because the flowers and the water have gotten knocked over. All these things she's been working on. I kind of don't blame her for being upset. On closer inspection, the incalculable loss didn't turn out to be as bad as I thought. I carefully sorted out all the papers that were stuck together and separated them in the attic. After that, I hung them all up on the clotheslines to dry. It was a funny sight, and I couldn't help laughing myself. Maria De Demisi, beside Charles V., William of Orange, and Marie Antoinette, it's a racial outrage, was Mr. Van Dan's joke on the subject. After I'd entrusted my papers into Peter's care, I went downstairs again. Which books are spoiled, I asked Margot, who was checking up on them. Algebra, she said. Imagine if all the books were destroyed, Anne would probably find that the least of her worries, right? Because we know how she feels about algebra. I hurried to her side, but unfortunately, not even the algebra book was spoiled. I wish it had fallen right in the vase. I've never loathed any other book as much as that one. There are the names of at least 20 girls in the front, all previous owners. It is old, yellow, full of scribbles and improvements. If I'm ever in a really very wicked mood, I'll tear the blasted thing to pieces. So yeah, she was kind of hoping the algebra book was a little more destroyed than it was. We are on 237, Monday the 22nd of May, 1944. Dear Kitty, on May 20th, Daddy lost five bottles of yogurt on a bet with Mrs. Van Dam. That's your challenge? I haven't looked that up, so someone needs to look up what yogurt is. And in your key points, I want you to put yogurt and put what it is. The invasion still hasn't come yet. It's no exaggeration to say that all Amsterdam, all Holland, yes, the whole west coast of Europe, right down to Spain, talks about the invasion day and night, debates about it, and makes bets on it and hopes. So remember, guys, they are waiting on the British to invade. They are wanting this war to be over. They're wanting to be rescued. And so that's what their hopes are lying on. 
The suspense is rising to a climax. By no means everyone we had regarded as good Dutch have stuck to their faith in the English. By no means everyone thinks the English bluff a masterly piece of strategy. Oh no, the people want to see deeds at last, great heroic deeds. Nobody sees beyond his own nose. No one thinks that the English are fighting for their own land and their own people. Everyone thinks that it's their duty to save Holland as quickly and as well as they can. What obligations have the English towards us? How have the Dutch earned the generous help that they seem so explicitly to expect? Oh no, the Dutch will have made a big mistake. The English, in spite of all their bluff, are certainly no more to blame than all the other countries, great and small, which are not under occupation. She's talking about all the other countries that have not been occupied by Germany. And she's like, we've got all our high hopes on the English. Why should they be doing everything for us? Shouldn't these other places be standing up too? Why is it just the English? The English really won't offer us their apologies, for even if we do reproach them for being asleep during the years when Germany was remaining, we cannot deny that all the other countries, especially those bordering Germany, also slept. We shan't go get anywhere by following an ostrich policy. And if you don't know what that means, you know, they always talk about how an ostrich protects itself by sticking its head in the sand. And she's talking about that's what these other countries, that's what people are doing. They're kind of turning their heads to what's happening and sticking their head in the sand. England and the whole world have seen that, that only too well now. And that is why one by one, England, no less than the rest, will have to make heavy sacrifices. We are at 238. No country is going to sacrifice its men for nothing, and certainly not in the interests of another. England is not going to do that either. The invasion with liberation and freedom will come sometime, but England and America will appoint the day, not all the occupied countries put together. To our great horror and regret, we hear that the attitude of a great many people towards us Jews has changed. We hear that there is anti-Semitism now in circles that never thought of it before. Anti-Semitism is hatred against the Jews. This news has affected us all very, very deeply. The cause of this hatred of the Jews is understandable, even human sometimes, but not good. The Christians blame the Jews for giving secrets away to the Germans, for betraying their helpers, and for the fact that, through the Jews, a great many Christians have gone the way of so many others before them and suffered terrible punishments and a dreadful fate. This is all true, but one must always look at these things from both sides. Would Christians behave differently in our place? The Germans have a means of making people talk. Can a person entirely at their mercy, whether Jew or Christian, always remain silent? Everyone knows that it is practically impossible. Why then should people demand the impossible of the Jews? It's being murmured in underground circles that the German Jews who immigrated to Holland and who are now in Poland may not be allowed to return here. They once had the right of asylum in Holland, but when Hitler has gone, they have got to go back to Germany again. When one hears this, one naturally wonders why we are carrying on with this long and difficult war. We always hear that we're all fighting together for freedom, truth, and right. Is discord going to show itself while we are still fighting? Is the Jew once again worth less than another? Oh, it is very, very sad that once more, for the umpteenth time, the old truth is confirmed. What one Christian does is his own responsibility, and what one Jew does is thrown back at all Jews. And guys, that research could go on and on and on. You look back at the history of the Jews and how they have been displaced so many times, and... Um, how they've been hated so many times. It goes back to biblical times and um, still continues to this day among some people. Um, quite honestly, I can't understand that the Dutch, who are such good, honest, upright people, should judge us like this. We, the most oppressed, the unhappiest, perhaps the most pitiful of all peoples of the world, whole world. I hope one thing only, and that is that this hatred of the Jews will be a passing thing, that the Dutch will show what they are after all, and that they will never totter and lose their sense of right, for anti-Semitism is unjust. 
And if this terrible threat should actually come true, then the pitiful little collection of Jews that remain will have to leave Holland. We, too, shall have to move on again with our little bundles and leave this beautiful country which offered us such a warm welcome and which now turns its back on us. I love Holland. I, who, having no native country, had hoped that it might become my fatherland, and I still hope it will. So, again, many people are being displaced and taken from this place that they love as it's being occupied by Germany. And um, it is very sad to see what's happening. And, um, and like she said, too, there are those people that would like to help. But when you are being threatened and pushed by uh, German authorities, you, too, sometimes will turn your back on even people that you care about because of the threat to your life. So it's really sad. And we also know of all the propaganda that's going on in the war by Hitler to make the Jews look bad to everybody there. He blames them for the debt they were in during World War I. He blames them for every problem going on in Germany at the time. And so, um, and remember, they're not able to hear what is going on with the war on the good terms as far as America or as far as uh, Britain is concerned. They're only hearing what Hitler wants them to hear, which is why the radios were taken away so they couldn't listen to the BBC. Now we do know that Anne and her family are sneaking to hear things that they would be in great trouble if they were discovered. Um, well, they're going to be in trouble if they're discovered no matter what. Thursday, the 25th of May, 1944. Dear Kitty, there's something fresh every day. This morning our vegetable man was picked up for having two Jews in his house. It's a great blow to us, so I would definitely mark that. Um, not only that those poor Jews are balancing on the edge of an abyss, but it's terrible for the man himself. So not only are the Jews are in trouble, but this man, once again, trying to help. The world has turned topsy-turvy. Respectable people are being sent off to concentration camps, prisons, and lonely cells. And the dregs that remain govern young and old, rich and poor. One person walks into the trap through the black market, a second through helping the Jews or other people who have had to go underground. Anyone who isn't a member of the NSB doesn't know what may happen to him from day to day. I mean, day to another. So guys, again, um, people want to help people, but they're also being taken away. So it's so sad to see what's happening. Very scary and courageous for people to risk their lives to help other people. And it just makes you want to analyze yourself and ask yourself what you would do in this situation. Um, I question myself all the time of what I would want to do, what my heart tells me is right to do, and what would I do. And it's also easy to say what you would do until you're in a situation. This man is a great loss to us, too. The girls can't and aren't allowed to haul along our share of potatoes, so the only thing to do is to eat less. I will tell you how we shall do that. It's certainly not going to make things any pleasanter. Mummy says we shall cut out breakfast altogether, have porridge and bread for lunch, and for supper fried potatoes, and possibly once or twice per week, vegetables or lettuce, nothing more. We're going to be hungry, but anything is better than being discovered, yours and. Guys, it's just sad just to see how things are progressing in the annex. Um, it makes me want to cry to think of how spoiled I am and what they're going through. Friday, the 26th of May, 1944. Dear Kitty, at last, at last, I can sit quietly at my table in front of a crack of window and write you everything. I feel so miserable. I haven't felt like this for months. Even after the burglary, I didn't feel so utterly broken. On the one hand, the vegetable man, the Jewish question, which is being discussed minutely over the whole house, the invasion delay, the bad food, the strain, the miserable atmosphere, my disappointment in Peter, and on the other hand, Ellie's engagement. Whites and reception, flowers, Crayler's birthday, fancy cakes, and stories about cabarets, films, and concerts. That difference, that huge difference, it's always there. One day we laugh and see the funny side of the situation, but the next we are afraid, fear, suspense, and despair staring from our faces. Meep and Crayler carry the heaviest burden of the eight in hiding. 
meet in all she does and cradler through the enormous responsibility which is sometimes so much for him that he can hardly talk from pent up nerves and strain. Kufus and Ellie took look after us well too, but they can forget us at times, even if it's only for a few hours or a day or even two days. They even have their own worries, Kufus over his health, Ellie over her engagement, which is not altogether rosy, but they also have their little outings, visits to friends, and the whole life of ordinary people. For them, the suspense is sometimes lifted, even if it is only for a short time, but for us, it never lifts for a moment. We've been here for two years now. How long have we still to put up with this almost unbearable, ever-increasing pressure? So I would just make notes of those points that, again, Kufus and Ellie are risking their lives daily to help the people in the annex. But Anne makes the point that at least sometimes they can break away and still do fun things with other people because they're not in hiding, right? Um, but there's the, always the stress that they could too get caught for helping. But Anne is just saying they've been in the annex for two years, which I'd also make notes of that. But they never have that break away from their worries. They're in constant fear of getting caught. They're having less food to eat. The only brief moments of enjoyment they might get are the books that take them away from their cares maybe the conversations with each other and the conversations of um, listening to me and Ellie and Kufus tell them some of the positive things that they get to see. The sewer is blocked, so we mustn't run water or rather only a trickle. When we go to the WC, we have to take a lavatory brush with us and we keep dirty water in a large cologne pot. We can manage for today, but what do we do if the plumber can't do the job alone? The municipal scavenging service doesn't come until Tuesday. Meep sent us a currant cake made up in the shape of a doll with the words Happy Whitson on the note attached to it. It's almost as if she's ridiculing us. Our present frame of mind and our uneasiness could hardly be called happy. The affair of the vegetable man has made us more nervous. You hear shh from all sides again and we're being quieter over everything. The police forced the door there so they could do it to us too. If one day we too should, no, I mustn't write it, but I can't put the question out of my mind today. On the contrary, all the fear I've already been through seems to face me again in all its frightfulness. This evening at eight o'clock, I had to go to the downstairs lavatory all alone. There was no one down there. As everyone was listening to the radio, I wanted to be brave, but it was difficult. I always feel much safer here upstairs than alone downstairs in that large, silent house. Alone with the mysterious muffled noises from upstairs and the tooting of motor horns on the street. I have to hurry for I start to quiver if I begin thinking about the situation. Again and again I ask myself, would it not have been better for us all if we had not gone into hiding and if we were dead now and not going through all this misery, especially as we shouldn't be running our protectors into danger anymore? But we all recoil from these thoughts too, for we still love life. We haven't yet forgotten the voice of nature. We still hope, hope about everything. I hope something will happen soon now, shooting if need be. Nothing can crush us more than the restlessness. Let the end come, even if it is hard. Then at least we shall know whether we are finally going to win through or go under. How sad again, guys, this young, young girl is almost saying that it would be better to be dead now than to go through what she's going through. She's still got the hope on the one side of her mind, but the other side of her in a way has given up hope. And it's kind of like someone dying of cancer who is ready to die. This is a metaphorically a cancer in their lives and they're ready to, she is anyway, ready for it to come to an end. On one side, the hopes, on the other side, let's get this over with. Wednesday, 31st of May, 1944. Dear Kitty, it was so frightfully hot on Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday that I simply couldn't hold a fountain pen in my hand. That's why it was impossible to write to you. The drains went foot again on Friday, were mended again on Saturday. Um, Mr. Kufius came to see us in the afternoon and told us masses about Corey and her being in the same hockey club as Jopie. 
And again, they're talking about their kids. On Sunday, Ellie came to make sure no one had broken in and stayed for breakfast. On Whit Monday, Mr. Van Dan, Mr. Van Santen acted as the hideout watchman. And finally, on Tuesday, the windows could be opened again at last. There's seldom been such a beautiful, warm, one can say hot, Whitson. The heat here in the secret annex is terrible. I will briefly describe these warm days by giving you a sample of the sort of complaints that arise Saturday. Lovely what perfect weather we all said in the morning, if only it wasn't quite so warm, in the afternoon when the windows had to be closed. Sunday. It's positively unbearable, this heat. The butter's melting. There's not a cool spot anywhere in the house. The bread's getting so dry. The milk's going sour. Windows can't be opened. And we wretched outcasts sit here suffocating while other people can enjoy their wits and holiday. Monday. My feet hurt me. I haven't got any thin clothes. I can't wash the dishes in this heat. All this from Mrs. Van Dan. It was extremely unpleasant. I still can't put up with heat, and I'm glad that there's a stiff breeze today, and yet the sun still shines. Yours, Anne. So I like how at the very end, she kind of puts, again, a ray of light on the fact that it's miserably hot. So we end, well, we're going to read one more. I take that back. Monday, the 5th of June, 1944. We're at the bottom of page 243. Dear Kitty, Fresh secret annex troubles, a quarrel between Dussel and the Franks over something very trivial, the sharing out of the butter. Dussel's capitulation, um, remember that, um, wait, my mind just went blank. Dussel's capitulation, Mrs. Van Dyne and the latter, very thick flirtations, kisses, and friendly little laughs. Dussel is beginning to get longings for women. The Fifth Army has taken Rome. The city has been spared devastation by both armies and air forces and is undamaged. Very few vegetables and potatoes. Bad weather. Heavy bombardments against the French coast. And Pas de Calais continue. So there are several little important notes in that very last paragraph. So basically what it means is by Dussel's capitulation, remember that kind of means surrender. So he's basically surrendering now to Miss Van Dam. Remember she's been flirting with him all along. And you can imagine that being stuck in a place that long will make you find someone that even normally you wouldn't find attractive, attractive. And I think that's basically what it means. He's starting to long for women, so he's finally maybe giving in to her flirtations just a little bit. Nothing inappropriate is happening, but she's just flirting, and I think he's starting to enjoy it a little bit after being pressured so much. But make a note about the Fifth Army taking Rome. And... Um, Heavy bombardments against the French coast and Pas de la Calais. I mean, Pas de Calais. Calais. I'm sorry, I can't talk. So, anyway, we will stop there at the bottom of page 243. And um, a lot of um, things happened in this section. Um, and then next time we will start with Tuesday, the 6th of June, 1944. Everyone have a wonderful day.